Hello and welcome to Data and Analytics Week of the Oktoberfest. My name is Vitaly Rudnitsky. I'm a SAP developer advocate and I'm your host for this week. Uh, we started this week yesterday with some presentations, uh, demystifying data science in enterprise as well as the modern enterprise data landscape. You can watch recordings of these sessions uh, already on our SAP Developers YouTube channel. Uh, there will be one more presentation tomorrow presented by truly yours on the topic of data visualization. But today's day is all about meeting authors of uh, data and analytics uh, books published by different publishers. We had the first panel already today morning, my time, with uh, Tarma, Thorsten, Stefan joining. And now we have second panel with Melanie, Heather, and Conrad. So let me stop speaking. And I would like our panelists to introduce themselves. Melanie, you go first. Thank you for this nice introduction. Welcome. Um, my name is Melanie Holzapfel, and I'm working as data scientist at SAP in the TNI BTP design unit. Um, I do have a physics background and joined SAP two years ago. And since then, as data scientist, working with data dashboards, data visualization was a big part for me, as well as being an IBCS consultant. Cool. That uh, but now, because you mentioned IBCS, and I'm going actually to mention IBCS tomorrow mm -hmm. uh, during my session as well, but could you just maybe explain in few words what IBCS is? Sure, that's a great point. So IBCS stands for International Business Communication Standards, and many parts are already in the name. Um, it is a notation standard and general standards and recommendations how to improve your business communication. And you can apply many of them for emails, dashboards, reports, the full part. Um, but for me personally, I mainly use these standards for dashboards to have efficient and yeah, the best business communication with dashboards and reports. And everyone can recognize that you're a truly certified expert in IBCS because I believe even if I would wake you up at night, <laughs> you would be able to explain what IBCS is. Just, Definitely. Uh, just as you have done uh, right now. Cool, uh, Heather? Hi, I'm Heather Hill, and I've been in the data and analytics space for about 15 years now. I started out with uh, Crystal Reports and Desktop Intelligence, for those who might have remembered those tools, and uh, more recently with Web Intelligence and SAP Analytics Cloud, among other technologies. And I um, have been a, a leader, led teams in implementing uh, analytic solutions across organizations. And today I'm an analytics leadership coach um, and I have my own company, BI Success Coach, where I do that. And then I'm also an SAP mentor where I'm able to work with SAP around the data and analytics technologies and be able to give feedback um, and, and advice on some of the future direction and some of the technologies that are out today. Great, thank you for joining. Conrad? Hey, uh, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, my name is Konrad Zawenski. I'm coming from Poland. I'm based in Warsaw. And I started my IT journey uh, 10 years ago when I started, when I joined my first consulting company, uh, working as an analyst in BI, but it was the Microsoft technology. So uh, after uh, some time, I got a project where I had my first experience with SAP, uh, it was mainly SAP HANA native, even though the project was uh, BW on HANA implementation, I was mainly focused on sub HANA native developments. So from that time, I was involved in many different uh, projects related to uh, SAP HANA modeling. And uh, once I left the consulting after five years, I joined uh, my current employer. So uh, I joined it as an in-house developer uh, where I also started to work as a HANA native developer. But uh, uh, since last two years, uh, our two different teams 
merged into one. So our BI team and HANA native team merged into one team during the BW for HANA migration. And since then I started to work also as a BW for HANA developer. And my current position is the technical reporting and analytics team leader. Okay. I'm glad that we have really um, people with different backgrounds, uh, different locations. We have SAP employee, we have person working on the customer side, we have a person running her own company. So I'm looking forward really to uh, our discussion. And the very first question, not a surprise, if you could introduce the book or the books uh, that you authored or uh, co-author. So let us go once again, starting with Melanie. Sure. Um, so the book I'm presenting is Designing Dashboards with SAP Analytics Cloud. So as you can see, one's here, um, one's in life. Um, and this book covers really the, the full end-to-end -end process of dashboard design. So we cover topics of like how to, how to figure out what you want to show, doing all the research, user research, how to set up the general layout of dashboards and all of these theoretical background parts from your full end-to-end -end process. But then we also cover the full building process. So we have many, many different examples in the book explained different use cases. So we do have planning, we have our widgets, we have a self-service BI dashboard, we have live connections. So we have many different dashboard options in SAP Analytics Cloud, which we explain where we show which concepts from this theoretical background are now applied, and then a step-by-step -step guide on how to build these dashboards yourself. And that is the book why I'm cool. here today. Cool. Now uh, from the cloud back to earth, Heather. <laughs> So uh, I helped co-author the SAP Business Objects Web Intelligence book, and it's actually in its fourth edition. The, the latest edition was updated for 4.2, and it has information on connectivity with HANA as well. Um, I was joking before the session that this is a pretty thick book. You, know, you, you definitely aren't missing anything, but the original version I still have here uh, was a lot thinner. So we've We've really, when we say we've expanded it, we've expanded it. There's a lot of stuff in here, but um, we had a lot of fun writing it. But I do want to comment that when Melanie was telling me about her book, I am loving it. And I'm going to get that one myself so that I can read it because I mean, your knowledge is just it, it, incredible. So I'm, I'm excited about that one too. Cool. Cool. And uh, now from front end, more to the back end, Conrad, how about your book? <laughs> Yes, so I'm author of, of the data modeling with sub bw 4 HANA 2.0. Uh, so this is the kind of uh, more of practical guide uh, of implementing uh, data models using the modern modeling concepts. So this book explains how to combine HANA native and bw 4 HANA uh, objects, how to use new functionalities of BW, and also this book walks the, the reader through uh, four modeling concepts, which, which I distinguished. And this, this, these concepts are uh, how to expose HANA objects through BW layer, how to create field-based data model without using info objects, uh, how to create hybrid data models, which is combination of open ODS views and info objects, and then also how to integrate SAP and non-SAP data uh, into the single model. And what is the publisher of your book? Uh, this is the Appers. Okay, yeah. So we have SAP Press, we have Appress. So as well, uh, people with different, uh, hopefully like different positive experience with your uh, respective publishers. We will get publishing process a little bit uh, later, but uh, Conrad, while you are still on the spot, so how did you become the author kind of like, what is your story? Okay, so actually I've never thought of becoming an author uh, in past. So uh, I've written a few uh, blog posts on uh, SAP community, but I, I was really never thinking to, to write a book. So my story was that I, during the pandemic, I got uh, an inquiry via LinkedIn from the uh, Appress editor 
and she asked me if maybe I'm interested to uh, to to author to become an author and maybe if I have any topics uh, that I would like to uh, describe. So of course at the beginning I completely ignored that message because I I, I didn't feel that I could do this. Uh, but but then there were two factors which uh, mainly caused that I started more and more to consider this option. So first of all, uh, surprisingly, the, the main factor was the pandemic. So uh, actually, I thought that this would be a great opportunity to, to use that uh, time when we are locked in our houses to commit myself and to make sure that I will use that time wisely and efficiently. So I thought, okay, that they will never, they will not be a better time than, than uh, pandemic to, to focus and to spend that uh, time in the most efficient manner. And then my second thought, okay, but what, what this book, what, what should be the topic for, for my book? So apparently uh, I had a, uh, my recent project, which, which I, had to uh, deep, uh, I mean, which I have to learn a bit more to be in, into BW4 uh, and explore the new functionalities because uh, our company wanted to bring a lot of non SAP data into the uh, SAC world. So I learned quite a lot during that, that project, and I thought that this could be a great opportunity to share my, my experience and also during. Uh, trying to search on the internet uh, multiple information on that topic, I, I couldn't find anything which which could be like uh, combined into the single step-by-step -step guide. So I thought that this could be a good opportunity to to use this uh, project as a as a material for the book. Cool. Uh, actually, you know, because you mentioned that you published some blog post on SAP community. I checked mine. I have 154 blog posts <laughs> there. And even though pretty much all of them are on the topic of data and analytics, APRES actually contacted me in the past asking if I would write a book about ABAP. And guilty <laughs> uh, as charged after 20 years working with SAP technologies, I probably wrote one ABAP program and a few user exits. So I was not the best one to write that <laughs> book. So uh, I actually contacted APRES editors here with local people uh, from our SAP community in Poland. And these guys published their book oh. on, 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 on ABAP. Uh, so I'm still bookless, let's put it this way, but <laughs> I'm looking very much uh, toward the inspiration uh, hearing your story. So Heather, how did you become an author? Well, like Conrad, mine also started on LinkedIn um, back in, I just had to check the publishing date for the first edition, but back in 2009, um, Jim Brogdon, who's the lead author on the book, contacted me. Um, I think my LinkedIn profile had that I was a certified um, web intelligence instructor. And so he contacted me and said, hey, I want to write this book on web intelligence. Since you're an instructor, are you interested? And also like Conrad, I kind of ignored it. I'm like, who is this guy? You know? <laughs> like, is he serious? Is this like a spam message? <laughs> like, who wants to write that book? And so I finally thought, well, I'll respond back and see if it's legit. And uh, so I did. And we started talking and, you know, created a table of contents and presented it over to SAP Press for approval. And um, we ended up, you know, just taking off from there. And we added co-authors as we went for gaps that we had in our own knowledge and uh, it was it, it was it was it was a lot of fun. But, um, you know, getting started was. It wasn't something I was planning on ever doing. So mm -hmm. uh, it was just, you know, a LinkedIn message. So yeah, definitely a good source, I guess, for finding folks to co-author with. Right. So it sounds that ignorance is not always a bliss, right? A blessing. <laughs> right. <laughs> and you need to open the door when opportunity knocks. It's true. It's true. I was pretty hesitant. To, you know, we get a lot of messages on LinkedIn and a lot of it is, is, you know, solicitation. So, but it was great. You know, I, we became friends after that. So it, it was, it was a good thing that I, I said, yes. Cool. Cool. Uh, Melanie. 
I, I can just jump on and say that for me, it was exactly the same as for <laughs> Heather and Conrad that I, I didn't plan on becoming an author um, personally. So that, that wasn't my original plan. Um, but like roughly one and a half years ago, so my manager and his manager started to thinking about this book and getting this idea for the book and how to make good dashboard design like accessible for more people because they had so many customer um, customer um, visits and I've seen that customers struggling with good dashboard design and I had the same experience that we do so much consulting in good dashboard design that the idea was born to become an author and for me personally so I'm one of six co-authors of this book um, in the beginning my plan was to only build the dashboards and I wasn't planning on, on writing big parts I was planning to do the dashboards and to to build my stories but then when when it went along, I mean, there's always more to a dashboard in just building it. So I was involved in so many parts of really creating the story and creating data sets and understanding why we want to exactly build this dashboard that I had all the knowledge to just like write some chapters myself. So that was basically the, the short path for me on how to be going from a dashboard designer and dashboard builder to, to an author that I was yeah, dragged into this project and on the way, I really enjoyed it. So I, oh. I didn't envision having so much fun writing a book. That was a great experience. And it, it, it's great that you are both great storyteller and great data storyteller, right? <laughs> and uh... <I> can... <laughs> there are many parallels between general storytelling and telling story with, stories with data. I can combine it nicely. <laughs> Right, right. And, and actually, you mentioned that you were one of six authors, right? Uh, so right. How, did, how did you cooperate with others? How did you work uh, with others like, to push forward or to move forward? Sorry, not to push them. Or maybe you were actually <laughs> the one who was pushing them. Um, yeah, so, so in general, um, we, we try to split up some parts of the book. Um, so... As mentioned earlier, we had this, these two big sections of the, the practical building part and then the theoretical background. And that was one part where we were able to like split it a bit so that we had like basically two groups writing different parts, but of course with many things in between. And then in these groups, each of them, they just met regularly and we worked together on stories. We exchanged experience. And then in the end, it was a big alignment or like on the way as well to align in between that all chapters match together, that the story builds on top of each other. So it was definitely a combination between like figuring out what is the other person doing? What did I do? How can I align? And then of course, wherever experience was missing, reaching out to even further people than just the six authors to get all the experience that was needed for this book. Okay, so there is even bigger army behind. Exactly. There were many, many um, really intelligent people behind of gathering all the all the content we need. Now it's always great to have someone to rely on. And Heather, you actually co-authored this. I don't remember how many people kind of like were involved in writing your book. Could you remind and how did work among your team were, looked like? Yeah, that's a good question because since we had four editions, it changed with each edition based on who was available to help with the writing, because we started back in 2009. And then I think the last one was around, it was a couple of years ago that it came out. So it was over like a 10 year span. So the first book had three authors, um, myself, Jim Brogdon and, and Matt Holden. And then we added in uh, Gabe Orthos, Dallas Marks, you know, some, some other guys in the industry who were very knowledgeable and, um, uh, other co-authors over the years. So the latest one has five co-authors. I do have to say that the writing experience is different between writing a book for the first time and then editing it and changing it later to make a new release. So the first one, we each should write our chapters. We could edit each other's and swap and collaborate, you know, with, you know, a Google Drive or what have you. Um, and it wasn't too it wasn't too too difficult to collaborate. But as we got to the editing piece, it was harder. So when we went to edit the first edition, we divided up the chapters again, but some of the chapters that you were working on, you might not have originally written. 
So, or it might have been your chapter, or somebody else might be editing your chapter and you're doing a different one, or you're writing a whole new chapter content. So, in that, it was harder to make sure that we had a consistent voice throughout all the chapters. So, it didn't seem really disparate in writing style. And then um, it was it was hard just working from somebody else's you know style and content. I originally thought, oh, it's not going to be too hard to edit it. Sure, I'll do it. It's okay. I don't have too much time. Oh my goodness, it took as much, if not more, time to edit because of just not working from scratch and changing things. Um, and most of it was to a new version. And of course, I don't know if you remember, it was like from 4.0 to 4.1 of Web Intelligence, they changed the whole look and feel of the interface and made the drawers functionality and all this new functionality. So all of our screenshots had to be updated. Everything like that had to be updated. So it, it was a lot of work. So it took a lot more collaboration later on. And that's also why we added in additional authors because... We needed, we needed extra help and it got pretty hefty and a lot of pages to look through. So I do think that with all that, you do have to have a lead who, who edits through and makes that common voice and just make sure everything kind of flows when you have a lot of different writers. I think that's probably was the biggest pain point in the process with multiple co-authors. And just so that we do not kind of like uh, put dot on the pain point, uh, I hope that there was a little bit of joy in this <laughs> process as well. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, it was a, it was a lot of fun. And, and, you know, you really learn and grow through the process because you are diving into things that you probably wouldn't have thought about explaining before. So the process of trying to explain something really helps you, you know, grow in your knowledge as well. So, and it really created like a team environment. Like we had to kind of have fun with ourselves and, you know, it, it was just a lot of fun to actually get to know people. I wouldn't have gotten to know. And I actually um, would meet up with them at an event, you know, like a tech ed or whatever event, you know, back then we had some other events too for data and analytics and it, that was kind of fun too, you know, just to have that camaraderie, you know, that shared, sure. you know, we were in the trenches together, figuring it out and we, we rose to the top and triumphed. <laughs> Actually, even, even though I didn't publish any book, I uh, used to publish um, uh, some articles for uh, SAP Insider BI Expert magazine when it was still uh, the thing. Uh, and uh, one of these articles uh, I co-authored with, uh, I believe, uh, Catherine Rose, who was based in Florida. I was based in California at that time. So we never met. Uh, but we worked together on this article and one of the like first thing that we had to establish was exactly the common language right like the common so that we call things the same way on both right. sides yeah and yeah. once we did we, we were done with that then it like continued and and it flew uh conrad and in your case i believe you are the single author right Yes, yes, so I didn't have this challenge to uh, be consistent with others. So this is from one hand uh, a bit advantage because I could I could plan everything uh, from scratch and uh, you know follow my standards, my naming convention, etc. But on the other hand, on the other hand, of course, I didn't have nobody to challenge me to check if everything is. Uh, good to also exchange our experiences, knowledge. So this is, of course, the disadvantage of, of being the, the only author in the book. And you mentioned like starting from scratch, and this is my next question, like how difficult it was to start, you know, like there is this moment where you need to sit in front of the keyboard and you need to type the very first word. Mm -hmm. How difficult was it for you to start? Yeah, so I think that the key in entire process was to create a table of contents. So this was the first step. And then I, I tried to make up my mind to collect some keywords, some uh, short sentences, some links into each of the sections so that I have like clear idea uh, on what the specific chapters and sections will be focused. So once I, I had this already, I also thought, okay, 
this is the scope, but I also thought what, what should not be the, the scope, what, what should be out of the scope of that book, because I think this is also important to not start writing on everything. So once I had this uh, overview, this table of content, so I started to uh, a bit structure my thoughts. So uh, also I, I started to collect the materials and structure them so that I, I had a good reference when writing. Uh, so, so I think that, that this, this two, two points are the, the main. And then uh, I also started to review some other books which I have uh, on my shelf in order to check what is the uh, structure, how usually the chapter starts and ends. So I didn't have any experience. So, so I used uh, existing books as a reference, of course. So this was another thing uh, which, I, which I used as a reference. And then what I think also, this is, it's, a, it's a key, uh, it was to prepare the writing schedule. So even though the publisher uh, gave me some timelines, I, I tried to prepare more details, uh, dates and timelines, which I want to follow. And uh, I try to always be ahead of the schedule uh, in case I had some uh, issues or unexpected problems so that I, I have this backlog uh, uh, backup of the time uh, and, and I will make sure that everything will be uh, delivered on time. So to summarize, I would say that uh, we should have a good plan, table of content and the writing schedule. And of course, mm -hmm. uh, materials which should be somehow structured because at some point you're Getting a, getting a lot of links, books, and then it's really difficult to uh, to, to 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 find the relevant information. So it's it's good to have a kind of the index, one document which covers everything, high level. Sure, and and especially that you know technology is changing as you are writing this book. So uh, Heather, <laughs> is it is it really like that you are building the plane while flying the plane? during the process of writing the book? Yeah, I, you know, Connor also brought up a good point too, uh, I wanted to mention that just on what he was just saying is um, with SA, with SAP Press, writing with them is a little bit different since they try to make all the books consistent among each other. So you're provided with a template and a lot of um, like what the title's supposed to look like, what's this, what everything's supposed to look like in your Word document that makes it a lot easier where Conrad, you had to do a lot of research around, okay, how do I want this to be structured? They kind of tell you how exactly to structure it. And then there's like a, a special tool even for creating your index and all those things. So everything is consistent. So I, I do have to say that was a really big blessing that we had that with SAP Press. And I can imagine that would be really hard if you didn't have that. <laughs> like, what are you saying? Like, that is not a small task to kind of define all on your own. So that that's pretty huge. But I can't remember the question you actually asked me. I just <laughs> wanted to comment on Conrad's. Uh, okay, but but then the question to you yeah. is like, okay, you are in the writing process. So how do you keep yourself motivated? How do you keep yourself, you know, on this schedule that Conrad mentioned? Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Um, so yeah, we did have timelines and we did have checkpoints where we would check in with the other co-authors. Uh, for example, at the beginning, we each would just write one chapter and share it so that we can make sure we're on the same page, we're doing the right style, we're, we're at a good point. And then we'd have other different checkpoints just be we were holding each other accountable, which is really helpful because we did have that. Um, but just personally, um, at the time I had little ones. So my... My youngest is uh, 15 now, so he he was, you know, a toddler at the time. So that made it a little bit more difficult to have that writing time. So I actually put music in headphones and had my headphones on and had my dedicated time, like between, you know, eight and 10 o'clock, I'm going to be doing writing and nobody's allowed to bother me. So I really had to like be very structured in order to be able to balance everything out between work, home, and then this extra project I was doing. So, uh, actually, in the previous session, Torsten mentioned that uh, like he wrote his book together with his wife, but in the meantime, they got a baby. So now he's charged with growing the third co-author for the third edition of their book. 
uh, but uh, but but as well uh, you know there is the beginning there is the middle but then there is always this moment where i need to put the final dot so melanie what was the kind of like this moment or, or how difficult it was like to put this final dot close your laptop and say we are done so there were two big parts and two big emotions on this part because the first one is always that you, you want to make it even better and you want to continue and expand it further and do more research and get more feedback from colleagues for example but on the other hand i mean as the deadline is approaching at some point there's no other chance than just to finish it because you have to hand it in and i, I agree that having um a publisher is a great blessing because you do have a deadline. If I would write it on my own and if I don't have a publisher with a deadline, I think we could easily write like two or three years on such a book because there's always something to add. Um, so that was, yeah, it was great to have this, this time pressure to really need to finish it. And then once this deadline arrived and we really had the situation that we had to send it out and then it was sent out, it wasn't, it, it was also a great relief because like all this work was just done and now you had the situation that there's not this this double work so not your normal usual work and the book project so for me it was without a toddler but it was also like still quite stressful and then yeah it's really the combination between ah oh, i wanted to do more but i'm relieved that i could finish a project and from this point on you're i mean for, for the full time you're looking forward to the final book but I think that is a special moment that you're just so glad that you've done it. You've written a book and you will be an author. So mm -hmm. yeah, it was, it was a magical point and a magical moment, I would say. Okay. That's great. And uh, Andrew Diaz is asking, uh, do authors really rest based on their experience? They do a lot of work and how many hours in general do you spend at work, uh, like at work, your normal work, like your paid job, and then on top of this, writing the book. And do you really rest? Do you really have time to rest? Who wants to take this question first? I'll go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we all want to. We all want to comment. I, I would say if you're in a technology career, if you've chosen that career path, you know that you always have to learn and grow and spend a lot of time outside of work doing that. And writing a book is a great way to do that because it enables you to dive deeper into a technology that you probably haven't dug that deep before when you're trying to explain something to somebody. It's just a different level of understanding. And so, um, I, I mean, I, I just think that as technologists, we're all, <laughs> we're, we're, we all work a lot, <laughs> you know, whether it's, whether it's at our job or, you know, doing that extra work, but that's what we do it because we love it. You know, we're in this career space because we love to learn. We love to grow. We love to continue to learn these new technologies. And so it doesn't really feel like work when it's something that you love to do. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> Melanie Conrad, how um, about you guys? Do you rest at all? Yeah, so perhaps to add there, so from, from the workload itself, so for the beginning part, I, I would say it's like, 10 or 20% more workload than a usual week. And in the end, like getting closer to the deadline, it's it's easy 50% or more on top of the usual work. But in the end, we're still all humans. So we need some rest. And even though there are stressful times, you can't always work on this peak. So having the week before the deadline, there you, you just don't have too much rest. And there's just a lot of work and weekends and evenings and all that stuff. Um, but that's really only the peak because like for, so we've written like nearly one year on this book. Um, so there's no way to work in this peak for a full year. And therefore we, we definitely had rest, especially in the first month of it because otherwise you, you can't do it and you can't finish it, so. Okay, so the good news for Andrew, yes, there is time to take rest. Conrad, <laughs> did you take any rest? <laughs> Yeah, so so in my case, uh, it was maybe a bit a bit different. So I was really trying to uh, finalize the book as soon as possible. So oh uh, when I when I was able to uh, finish my work, let's say after this regular eight hours, then for sure I, I tried to spend additional four hours, three four hours for the writing. 
because uh, frankly speaking, when you write a book, you cannot plan that, okay, every day I will take, uh, I, I will plan, I don't know, 30 minutes to, to write a book because within one hour, you just uh, starting, you just resuming the writing because you need to uh, catch up on what you already written. You, you need to collect your ideas and then after one hour, you can really start uh, writing. So, so that's why I, I wanted to fin finalize this book as soon as possible. And mm -hmm. I, I was really pushing. So whenever I had time, uh, I, was, I was writing. So of course, weekends, uh, four to five hours. And, and uh, during the week, uh, three hours, let's say daily. Uh, and, and of course, uh, from time to time, I, I, I need to have a, uh, have a break. Because otherwise, yeah, as, as Melanie mentioned, we are just humans. So, so this this is of course needed. But but maybe my book was not that big as yours. So in total, I spent uh, like less than seven months in, in the writing process. So I published my first my first three chapters out of six within two and a half months. So so this was pretty uh, tight schedule. Yeah, it's better you take a break before this job breaks you, I think. <laughs> and uh, in the meantime, I uh, ran a poll uh, in our chat uh, asking if there are any aspiring authors uh, watching us live. So let me just quickly uh, check uh, if I see the results. So 37% uh, are considering or dreaming about writing books. So I hope that kind of like all your examples and all the wisdom that you are sharing will really uh, help them. Is there anything in like writing process or publishing process or any other hints how to stay healthy mentally and physically while writing the book that I didn't ask you, but you still would like to uh, share? Melanie, would you go first? Yeah, sure. I can start. So I think one one big part is uh, there was a big learning for me in, in the writing process that you have a lot of freedom because like it's your book. You can basically do whatever you want. I mean, of course, if there's a publisher behind, you need to hand in the table of content and you have like some sort of structure and feedback from the publisher. But in general, it's your book and you can do and write and create it as, as you like. Um, that is a big responsibility because it, it's on your shoulders to make a great book and to make it consistent and really valuable because you want to bring value to your reader. But on the same, at the same time, you can really say, okay, I do have a vision for my book. You usually don't start writing a book without the vision behind. And so often you do have this purpose and this value you want to bring into your book and into the world with it. Um, so yeah, we can just stick to it and you can just stick to this vision and then mm -hmm. recap get feedback from, from colleagues, from friends. Um, and if there's some, sometimes you have like some, some blocks in between. So you try to write the chapter, or you try to create it, gather content. And if, you, if you're stuck somewhere, stepping back and have like one day or two days of distance between the book and the project and yourself definitely helps because then yeah, your ideas can flow again and you can overcome this. This being stuck quite easy if, if you have some distance in between. I think that is that is my main advice. Uh, yeah, that's, this, this is a great advice. Uh, Heather, anything more from your side? Yeah, I agree with Melanie in, in uh, I mean, just like when you're trying to like solve a, a fix a bug or some other issue, you know, sometimes you can't solve it and so you have to step away from the problem. Uh, I think that's the same thing with writing in uh, I mean, you can schedule time, but sometimes in that time, you might not be stuck and it might be because you don't have that balance and haven't made that balance. So I do think that that does lend a lot. I mean, I have to do that with everything. I can get stuck writing a blog you know, and you have to step away and say, okay, you know what? I really haven't had any me time. You know, I need to go to the gym or, you know, I, I just need to step away for a little bit. And it really, it really does like making sure you do have that balance does help you so that the time that you are spending is better spent. You know, your, your ideas are flowing, it's quicker. So it actually will enable you to spend less time in that process. If you're able to, um, you know, have that balance and be able to, to focus in. So. 
Great. Conrad, any additional hints from your side? Yeah, so, so maybe because I was the one who was really hesitating to, 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 to become uh, an author. So I, I thought that maybe I'm not experienced enough to, to become an author. So now I know that, that uh, taking this, this challenge and, and writing a book is the best way, the, the best learning process that you, you can have. So it's, I, I, I'm pretty sure that, that uh, existing uh, authors of the books were like not 100% uh, sure about everything what they are writing, but during the writing process, they learn a lot and then they become an expert. So mm -hmm. after I, I wrote my book after one and a half year of, of experience within BW4, and I, I, I didn't feel uh, very comfortable uh, with BW4. So, but, but during the writing process, I, I've really learned a lot. I, I uh, learned, read a lot of material. So I, I really recommend for all of the people who are uh, thinking about that. Cool. Actually, my exactly going into my next question. Uh, how do you learn, right? So there is no book for you to learn from, right? So uh, you need to learn first before you are able to write. That's one thing. And, and the other thing is that in this ever-changing technology world, you need to stay up to date all the time. So, uh, Conrad, how do you learn, if not from your own mm -hmm. book? <laughs> yeah, so, so of course the main experience comes from the project so and there is nothing better than hands-on experience but uh, of course uh, apart from that you need to uh, think also why a bit wider so my idea for learning is also exchanging the knowledge with my peers maybe from my past projects uh, to check what they are currently doing how they are solving the projects what are the technologies which they are using? So this kind of discussions, maybe some groups uh, on LinkedIn or, or, or Facebook, where you can just exchange your knowledge, knowledge with, the, with the colleagues from the past projects. So this is the one thing. And the other thing which I mentioned also this SAP community, which I really recommend. So uh, at the beginning, of course, I was the one who was asking the questions. Uh, but at some point I started to review questions of others and trying to uh, answer them by uh, by replicating the same scenarios from the uh, people who asked the question in my system and trying to resolve this on my own. So this is kind of the exercise which really helped me to understand a lot of scenarios and also I used this knowledge then in, in my project. Uh, and other than this, uh, I would recommend also the open SAP courses, which I, uh, I try to be up to date with. So these are really uh, good learning uh, materials. Sure, I just hope that you did not replicate these issues in your productive environment, right? <laughs> Hopefully not. Uh... Heather, how do you stay up to date with the knowledge, especially now that you are running your own company, which means that you are going to customers and they expect that you know everything? <laughs> I don't know about everything, but <laughs> uh, I definitely learn through the real world, through the real world, you know, from those experiences, like Conrad said, a lot of the same sources that Conrad said, um, you know, the SAP community, the blogs that are out there, and all the SAP tools have user guides. Oftentimes we don't know that they exist, but they are so full of amazing information. So, um, I mean, those are awesome too. So I, I definitely recommend if you don't, if you haven't downloaded the user guide for something, you should probably should. Um, so that's always great content, so much good content. But I also have gained a lot of knowledge just from groups that I've joined. Uh, ASUG has been really helpful uh, for a lot of their talks and stuff, as well as being a mentor has been, been really helpful and other groups that are out there, kind of like what Conrad was mentioning too. And then the other thing is events, like Tech Ed next week. Uh, I'm sure I'm going into another question, but Tech Ed next week's great. You know, I just love events. I'm probably like an event junkie, 
but I mean, and I've spoken at them and attended them and it's just it, both ways. I really love it because you can connect with other people. And if you haven't had a real world experience, you might learn somebody else's real world experience. And that time in learning that is just so beneficial. So I really, I really love doing that. And I can't wait for them to come in person again, but I'm excited for the next one. Yeah. We are all waiting for IRL in real life. <laughs> yeah. for sure. But uh, Heather, just because you mentioned ASAC and probably not everyone watching, you know, our stream knows what ASAC is, maybe just two, two words, what it is. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's America's SAP user group. I don't know if there's other ones in different areas of the world as well, but it's a user group where you can learn more about different technologies. You can say what your focus area is and what technology. There's local chapter meetings. Uh, there's also webinars and such. And so they, they publish a lot of great content. And some of the content is from the product managers of the different technologies at SAP. So you can have real world access to them to ask your questions, that type of thing. And I found it to be really useful. Thank you. And actually there is similar DSAC, which is a German user group. And there is a Polish user group that was established a few years back. Uh, so um, for people watching us, if you are like whatever, wherever you base, there is actually, as far as I remember, the web page on sap.com, which lists all the different user groups. So try to find this information and reach out to your user group because learning from your peers is obviously one of the great sources uh, for that. But enough me talking. Melanie, how do you uh, approach constant learning? Um, so I think, first of all, I can just agree with um, Heather and Conrad. So those have been great points. Um, and then secondly, um, there are two, two parts of learning for me. So one is the, the really like the new learning, the exploration, the research um, of information that isn't available yet. And that is something trying out and personal experience and like really like doing your own research, like really proper research. I think that is one important part where personal experience and experience from others is quite valuable to then try out realizing there's some issues mm -hmm. and then trying out, figuring out what are possible solutions and creating new things. Um, and then I think the second point of learning is the information is available somewhere in this world. We just don't know where. So there are like you've mentioned earlier on so many great resources of amazing information that is out there. And the important part is how to get to this information. <laughs> so one, one is of course like knowing where something is. The other is knowing someone who knows where something is. And the third one is like, again, like researching and having like research libraries, Googling stuff, um, having different platforms on where, where you can search for something. And then of course, like bringing it together in a book is like helping others to avoid this full process of searching for all these bits and pieces. I mean, there's, so much information out there you just need to find it and the you just need to find it is such a hard topic somewhere that yeah having condensed information from people where you know they've done a great research is is quite helpful for it sure and uh, just because at the beginning you know when you introduced yourself you did mention that you are certified ibcs consultant so how important is certification process in the overall learning um, so I would say it makes it easier to know which um, which source is trustful. So if I know someone and I know I can trust this person that the research they've done is, is good and valuable, then I personally don't need a certificate that the person knows what, they're to, what they are doing. Um, but if you get information from somewhere, so if there is some website and you don't know if the research they've done is great, then having a certificate is quite helpful because it helps to know, can I trust this source or can't I trust this source? So for example, if something is on an official SAP website, then it is like trustworthy because you know that there's a lot of like checks in between and you can't just publish anything you want there. Um, so I think having certificates helps to know if you can trust someone if you don't know this person or if you don't know if you can trust the research. And, and actually, there was uh, one more thing that really, I, I will be open, shocked me that one of the authors who presented in the previous panel 
he has, I believe, 150 certificates, official certificates on his uh, credly web page, right? And, and this is just okay. going back to how do you find free time like outside of the live stream? I asked him, so how do you do this? And he's, you know, like there are weekends. I said, yeah, but, but still. And he's just like, yeah, you know, weekend starts at 9 a.m. In the, on Saturday morning and it ends at 10 p.m. on Sunday evening. There is plenty of time in between. I'm just like, wow, <laughs> respect. So, um, but, but going back to Heather, what you mentioned already about TechEd. So uh, have you looked into agenda for this virtual TechEd that is happening two weeks from now? Are there any particular speakers or sessions you are looking for? Well, obviously the keynotes are always great just to hear about strategy and what's coming up. I know uh, Jurgen Mueller is going to be uh, kicking it off. So that'll be exciting. And then um, there's a lot of great sessions around SAP Analytics Cloud. And from the sneak peek that I've gotten in the past, um, I, I saw there's a lot of functionality that I just didn't realize was there or that it could be used in those different ways. So I'm really excited to, to check out some of that content with some of the product owners around there. And also Channel One. Channel One is a great spot you know, to jump in Thank and you. talk to others. So I'm super excited about jumping in on channel one. And I even put that on my calendar too. So I built out my agenda. I'm ready to go. <laughs> Thank you for mentioning this because our team is very much involved in production of channel one. Uh, actually, you will see hosts of channel one coming from our organization. Uh, and uh, it's great that you mentioned executive keynote, but uh, please do not miss as well developers keynote because there will be again this year two keynotes, just like it was last year. There will be uh, obviously an absolutely important executive keynote uh, delivered by our CTO, Jürgen Miller, but then our team is working on developer keynote and I hope guys, you will not miss it and that you will have fun uh, watching it just as much as we have fun just producing this. Conrad, uh, are you looking forward to TechEd? Uh, actually, have you participated in any TechEd Live before? No, this is my first uh, TechEd uh, session. So I'm really interested into the session about the future of enterprise data and analytics. Uh, and I also wanted to explore uh, uh, about this SAP Data Warehouse Cloud because I, I've got a feeling that this this is uh, a future, uh, long term maybe, but this is maybe some someday it will replace DW for Hana. So definitely, I would like to to see what what this DWC is about and what are the possibilities, limitations, differences between uh, Data Warehouse Cloud and and DW for Hana. And other than this, I would like to attend a session about uh, some data intelligence, which I think this is, is quite interesting. And uh, of course, the SAP uh, Analytics Cloud. And thanks for mentioning data intelligence. Actually, I am developer advocate responsible for data and analytics portfolio, including data intelligence, which is one of my favorite tools to work with. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, the first data intelligence book was published less than one week uh, ago uh, by SAP Press. So uh, this becoming available, uh, available too. And uh, Melanie, you and I are SAP employees, but uh, are you planning to participate uh, virtually or maybe presenting anything at this year ticket? So I'm, I'm planning on presenting virtually um, and especially for like some, some parts. So all the, the artificial intelligence parts I'm really interested in um, because like with, with my background and having done my thesis um, with a lot of machine learning, I'm always keen to like see what is, what is the current status in, in the industry mm -hmm. and what is done at SAP in regards of artificial intelligence, what is the vision behind. Um, so I'm, definitely looking forward for these talks and there are a couple of them so I, I have to see how many I can attend there 
Cool, cool. Uh, actually, uh, shameless plug. Yesterday, we had these two sessions that I mentioned, and one of them was demystifying data science in enterprise. And I believe that our SAP colleagues from this deep learning uh, center of excellence really kind of like tried to unveil this hype layer and to show what is inside and how the work of data scientists look like, including playing Mario Kart 64. <laughs> So um, it sounds like it is not just the best paid job on the market, on IT market right now, but it might be lots of fun as well. Uh, actually, uh, we have to move back for like writing and publishing for a second because I got a question if there are any helpful tools that you would like to share, something that helped you kind of like, you know, to write, to stay on schedule, because we were talking a lot about like, you know, approach, we were talking about uh, uh, the process, but are there any tools that you found especially helpful to uh, finish this uh, job? So Melanie, did you have? Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I don't have any special tools, so I do like the, the boring stuff like writing in Word and then collaborating together with my co-authors in Teams. So to just put everything in Teams, what we have, having the agenda in there, having notes in there and the timeline. Um, but other than that, we didn't have any like special edition. So it was really, we tried to, kept it, uh, to keep it simple, to not be like disturbed by too many tools. So yeah, really having a Teams folder or a team section for, for all the authors mm -hmm. and then writing normally in Word. Okay, keep it simple. Like exactly. It. Conrad, anything that helped you other than your text editor? No, I think that the Word was main friend during the uh, writing process. So we published, uh, I published my documents in the uh, Google shared Google disk and this word this was then reviewed by the technical uh, reviewer and he put the comments there also the uh, option of tracking the changes was enabled so I was always able to check what was corrected or changed so nothing really uh, new okay Heather hopefully at least you had some you know this secret tool that if anyone well, else would use well the only thing i would say is it, the tool where i needed a tool more wasn't the writing but was the screenshots so mm -hmm. i used snag it for screenshots which really helped so i could put the arrows and the squares around things we decided squares and not circles right? you have even have to collaborate on that but <laughs> But that really helped for making screenshots and making consistently, making them consistent, making them high enough resolution and, and all of that. So that's where I, I use the tool more than anything else. I also use um, online uh, word hippo to come up with different words for different things. Cause I found myself oftentimes having to, when I would go through to edit, I would say, I keep saying therefore like a million times or, you know, some word I would use a lot. I'd go in and use wordhippo.com and I would just look for alternate words for like a, th a thesaurus. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of helpful. It just went beyond the suggestions that um, word would give me. So those are a couple of tools. So this word hippo, could you just paste maybe the link, the URL, if this is something that is available online in, in our chat and I will just repost it in a uh, sure. YouTube chat. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, and while you're looking for that, actually I have to mention that one thing that I am using and abusing when I'm writing, okay, my blog post is Grammarly. As not being native English speaker, uh, you know, I need to rely a lot on that. So hopefully because of that, you will find that you can read my uh, posts. Okay. And uh, Heather, while you are still on the spot, the very last question, we are at the top of the hour. I hope that we can spend just a few more minutes. Uh, uh, what is the next big thing in your opinion in data and analytics space, if anything? Well, I, I think for me, since I really tend to lean on the strategic side and the business side. So the thing that really excites me is a lot of chatter has been around um, data and analytics becoming a core business function. And when I think about a core business function, I think about accounting department, finance department, asset management, you know, those departments. 
And, and to think that companies of all different sizes will put that level of importance into data analytics will really help us elevate that culture of data. And like with Melanie's work with dashboards that tell a story and all that, if organizations have that as a business function, it really helps make it more common within organizations. So that's like a really exciting thing for me. I'm also really excited at the focus when we, we, we hear a lot about, you know, um, data fabric as the foundation and some of the graph technology. I think that incorporating that into the architecture can also help elevate our architecture to be more business friendly. Like what we used to do or what we've done with the semantic layer, the same thing, but in the back end, it also makes it more business friendly to users, which will help as more organizations make it a core business function. So those are a couple of things I'm really excited about and looking forward to seeing, you know, what comes next in 2022. Interesting that you mentioned like, you know, semantic layer and you're mentioning graph technology, because this is something that uh, authors during the previous panel mentioned uh, as well. So great minds think alike, right? Uh, Conrad, uh, what are you looking for? What you believe is going to mm -hmm. be the next big thing? Yeah, so first of all, I think at some, at some point, everything will go to cloud. So we will not work anymore on any on-premise solutions. So uh, I think that this is the direction. And secondly, maybe uh, the area of planning and forecasting will be uh, developed even more uh, on the mm -hmm. dashboard side. So I believe that this might be the direction. Yeah, actually, I believe that your two answers made Melanie smile twice because first, you know, her book is about cloud, SAP Analytics Cloud. And the second is that the strongest point of SAP Analytics Cloud is obviously predictive planning, right? So there is lots of uh, augmented analytics built into the tool. So Melody, kind of like, you know, you cannot repeat what Conrad said. So what <laughs> do you think is going but, to be the next big thing? But I love those two answers. So that, that's great. Um, and, and I think just like, really like the, the business front it was another keyword I, I was really happy to hear because in my opinion, really making it easier for the end users is, is an important step. Um, having it automated. So, so for example, data preparation, et cetera, that this can be automated and having like the analytics done. So creating these dashboards to make it just easier and needing less manual work. I think that is really important to, to bring it in many, many mm -hmm. companies and to really use it. Um, so to not only have the ability to create great forecasts and great analytics and deep dives into the data, but make it so easy that nearly everyone can use it without too much training and without knowing all the details behind it. Um, yeah, so I think really easy usability and user friendliness and optimization are, are mm -hmm. really important and hopefully next steps we can see soon. Uh, actually, it, it sounds like, like, you know, the future is here, just not everyone knows about this because you mentioned about this augmented analytics and uh, I am, let's say, part-time visiting lecturer here at local university where I'm teaching business intelligence as well. And at one of the lectures, I showed uh, augmented analytics in SAP Analytics Cloud where you just point to the model or the data set and you say, generate the whole like you know, dashboard for me, storyboard for me. And there was a person who is practitioner there using SAP Analytics Cloud in their company. And she didn't know that there is something like this even exists in the tool. Right, so sometimes, as we said, just like the future is already here. You just need to know it is there and you need to use it. Okay, uh, sorry, we are a little bit over the time, but I really, really, really enjoyed our discussion a lot. I hope that uh, you too and that uh, whoever is watching us live and uh, will watch the recording uh, will enjoy and will benefit from all the wisdom that you have shared during this session. Uh, as Heather mentioned, I really hope that in the future we will be able to meet during some in real life uh, events. I'm very much looking toward, uh, forward to that as well. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone.